Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 229 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. The FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions, your one-stop shop for all things FCPA compliance related. Today I start a two-part podcast with Joe Orengel, Managing Director and Co-Founder at Visual Risk IQ. We take a look at what are data analytics in compliance. In this uh, part one, which is episode 229, I visit with Joe about uh, the concepts of data analytics, what they are, and how a compliance practitioner should think through the uh, scheduling or setting up of uh, transaction monitoring around your data analytics. In part two, we take a look at some case studies that Joe and his team at Visual Risk IQ have done, which would lend um, inform a compliance practitioner's use of data analytics. The episode comes in at just over 29 minutes. I hope you find it useful. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today, I'd start a two-part episode with my good friend and colleague, Joe Orengel, co-founder and co-managing director at Visual Risk IQ. Joe and I... Um, I interviewed Joe for a series of blog posts that went up uh, last week and asked Joe if he could come back on the podcast and maybe give us the uh, audio and walk us through some of the things that we put out in print last week. So, Joe, with that uh, introduction, uh, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Great to, uh, to be here and look forward to the discussion. So Joe, what I'd like to do is, uh, like I said, uh, we're going to have a couple of podcasts. Uh, this week. Uh, the first podcast, we're really going to talk about what is data analysis in a best practices compliance program and then how might a compliance practitioner think about setting up your analysis. And then in our second podcast, we're going to um, act, take a look at some of uh, actual case studies done by Visual Risk IQ and what intrigued me about the case studies where, were that they were not in the FCPA compliance space but they clearly were analogous to the types of things that um, you would look at in a uh, anti-corruption compliance program and have you walk us through what you did and how they might apply to the FCPA compliance practitioner. So uh, with that, uh, could you really start off explaining to a recovering trial lawyer what are data analytics and what are data analysis? Sure. Well, uh, you know, data, data analysis is really um, – Answering answering questions with facts as opposed to answering questions with opinion. Um, if you think back to some of our our readings that we did uh, high school and college, Sherlock Holmes was uh, someone that comes to mind. Really, even predating computers, Sherlock Holmes always um, used reasoning and and facts and things that he observed when solving um, solving mysteries. He didn't say, I think so-and-so uh, committed the murder um, because I didn't like them um, or because they look suspicious. It was, it was always based on, da on data. So the use of, of data analysis, um, using data to make determinations, really does predate computers. Um, your background is law. Mine is accounting and auditing. And the earliest um, auditing, both external and internal audit, are based primarily through using statistical samples. Let's use a large um, uh, sample, 50, 100 items, and we'll evaluate those, those items in our sample and then extrapolate an error rate to the entire population. That worked well in um, really before computers and before spreadsheets and before data analysis. And now we have the ability to download every transaction into a computer and have the computer answer the questions, not about a sample, but about the entire population. So how does this tie into the concept of big data? Well, big data is um, big data is primarily focused on what I'll call unstructured data. So the type of analysis that our firm does most often is structured data. 
that is credit card transactions, uh, invoices, both procurement and sales invoices, where the, the data is always in the same format. The first 10 characters are the um, vendor number, and the next 30 characters are the vendor name, and, and so on. In unstructured uh, data analysis, what you're doing is you're you're reading text, you're reading emails, you're reading social media, you're reading um, comments or Facebook posts, and parsing a very large field into smaller fields to uh, make a conclusion about the, the text that is there. Using a computer to read a newspaper article um, from the Iowa debates and read a transcript of the Iowa debates and, and parsing the words to figure out who feels there are more important issues related to how many times they said a certain keyword. That's, that's big data. That's, that's unstructured text analytics. Um, our firm has done a little bit of that, Tom, but, but most of our work is in structured data. And our advice to the compliance officer is, is that's probably the best place to begin. So I've used the example of the following. Let me see if, uh, what your comments might be. That audit is generally a very deep dive, but with a narrow focus. So that an auditor might look at one employee's expense reports going back multiple years. Uh, but they're not looking at multiple employees' expense reports or even all employees' expense reports. And uh, more of a, a data analysis or monitoring might be looking at a very large number of employee expense reports for a much shorter period of time. Does that resonate or is that close to what you have articulated? Very much so. The, the audit that is done is, is an inspection of documents, right? If, if I'm a, a manager in a department and I've got 10 or 12 people reporting to me, they submit their expense reports to me summarizing trips that they've, they've been on. And um, I look at that trip report, airfare, hotel, meals, who did they entertain? Okay, and then I approve that expense report, I put it down, and then I pick up the next one in the pile. The, the challenge with an approval process like that is you don't have the ability to really look across multiple expense reports. Mm -hmm. I've certainly seen this with, um, with folks that um, we've, we've done investigations on where the data analytics have, have thrown up some red flags. And uh, sadly, it's all too common for um, two company employees to go entertain um, a, a client or two, and the bill comes, and it's very expensive, and it's lavish, and it's, uh, it's probably inappropriate. And one of the things that they might do is, is both pick up half of the check. Now, one of them submits the expense report the first week they get back. The second one submits the other half of the expense with the same attendees a week or two later. And the, the approving manager um, remembers that they went to, to a certain city. They remember that they were supposed to entertain a, a client, so seeing a $120 lunch um, isn't uh, isn't alarming for four people. The problem was that the same manager saw a hundred and hundred and twenty dollar lunch from the other employee, and uh, perhaps two hundred and forty dollars in uh, you know in a, a medium sized town in uh, in South Georgia. But maybe that's maybe that's not an appropriate um, expense, particularly if we we're taking out people that work for one of the state hospitals. Let me uh, flip it around another way, Joe, and ask if um, the concepts you just uh, talked about, which really seem to be uh, moving more from what has happened to what is happening now and what can we do about it, do they fit into what's generally recognized as the three components of a best practices and uh, compliance program? And there are several formulations. One is prevent, detect, remedy. Uh, another is stop, find, and fix. Um, my, one of my favorites is Paul McNulty's, uh, what did you do to prevent it, what did you do to find out about it, and what did you do after you found out about it. But whichever of those formulations you might use or another one that you might articulate, how does the uh, 
the approach of data analysis to help the compliance officer within that structure? Sure. Well, the the, the thing that, that we do, and, and again, you, you mentioned the, the focus of where are you looking. Um, the traditional audit, the traditional inspection of data is a is a historical look back. And the example that, that I provided earlier, um, I described how a manager is looking at one expense report that was submitted last week or last month. And uh, the data analysis uh, component that we're talking about here might be for the compliance department to look at all expense reports that were submitted last quarter or last year. That is a, that's a historical data analysis. If we think about the analysis that our bank does, whether it's American Express or, or um, you know, Citibank or even BB&T, the banks that, um, that are looking at the transactions and where your, your card or my card is being used, um, we want their analysis to be near real time. If um, the volume of, of transactions, cash advances, and international purchases and uh, high-value electronics has spiked, um, chances are there's somebody using our card besides us, um, particularly if it's used, Tom, once in your, your hometown of Houston and on the same day the same card is being used overseas. And we don't want American Express or Visa to be doing that, that analysis once every three months or once every six months. We want that being done on a daily basis and on an hourly basis so that fraud and error can be detected sooner. What happens in the, the world of compliance, we have the opportunity to do those same queries, but instead of every quarter or every six months, um, Perhaps we should be using analytics to find transactions on a more frequent basis. And in fact, we do have some organizations that we work with that really do have those best practice compliance programs. They're doing their analytics weekly or even in a couple of cases, daily review of transactions. So one of the difficulties uh, someone like myself might have uh, as the chief compliance officer, a compliance practitioner, or, or even a, a lawyer in the legal department who's been given a compliance assignment is, is getting my head around a data analysis program. Numbers typically scare lawyers, so we don't trade in that. But you and your team have developed a framework to help companies think through the process, and, and you develop a five-step process. And I was wondering if you could now walk us through those steps and then uh, kind of explain how you would work with uh, a specific sophisticated client or someone like myself who might really be new to data analysis to, to set up a program. And certainly, and, and, and Tom, the, uh, the expertise that you have, I, I, it's certainly fair to, to say that uh, you are, are far better at describing <laughs> what a, um, a suspicious transaction is, right? Who are the, the government officials that we want to make sure we get pre-approval for? What are the, the types of allowable or not allowable enter, enter, uh, entertainment expenses, or what are the type of allowable or not allowable facilitating payments to get goods through customs? Um, our team is very good at data, um, tables and columns and rows, and how to, how to manipulate the query to find the, the transaction that meets the specification but the compliance officer, the legal expertise of what's a permitted or a prohibited transaction, um, really thoughtful data analysis marries the, the technical skills that our team tends to bring together with the domain expertise that folks like you and your, uh, your attorney friends, um, the, the expertise that you have. One of, the, one of the opportunities I think the profession has to do things better uh, data folks like ourselves, we need to we need to simplify um, the communication between the domain expert and the the data nerd, um, if you will. And the data nerd needs to be able to to ask questions in a, a very simple and straightforward way, so that we can understand the the transactions that you're looking for. The way
way that we do that, we when we begin our, our data analysis project, everything begins with brainstorming. What are the business events that may have occurred that would would be considered suspicious and something that you as the compliance practitioner would want to drill into more? And without having sample transactions and reports and SAP or Oracle or, or any technical words, we just want to know what is a what is a suspicious transaction look like? And in having that conversation and identifying the business questions that we want to answer, then we make the transition from brainstorming to really acquiring and mapping the data and writing some of the queries. We have a more technical conversation with IT and with finance and some of the other um, more technically minded folks at your firm, but everything really does begin with brainstorming and getting the uh, the attorney and the compliance executive to explain what it is that uh, that we're looking for. What are the expectations? What policies should have been followed? What might a mistake or even fraud look like? And um, it, it's really connecting that business question with the digital data source. They can answer the uh, the question in um, in quantity. How about step two? Well, uh, the, our deliverable from brainstorming is that list of business questions. What are the the things that we're looking to know? Acquiring and mapping the data that that is certainly a a technical step and where a number of folks can get tripped up. The, the good news is that most modern software can create a, a file that can be read by your basic, most basic of all data analysis software, that being Microsoft Excel. So whether you have a, a large or a sophisticated data warehouse or your, your ERP software is a big software like SAP or, or Oracle or even simple software like QuickBooks, um, all of those ERP uh, tools, those enterprise resource planning and accounting systems, they have the ability to export data into Excel. So an example of a test that we do, we're sometimes looking for a duplicate payment, we will download credit card charges that have been submitted on employee expense reports, and we also download invoices that have been processed by accounts payable, and we're looking to make sure whether anything has been paid twice once on card and once on uh, on an invoice through a check request or electronic funds transfer. Mapping that, that data and looking for a duplicate payment is simply a matter of, of getting the Excel files that come out of um, the two different systems into a same format so that we can easily inspect um, duplicates. I'm getting a little bit of my, ahead of myself here um, writing the queries happens only after the data has been acquired and mapped. And an important element there is also control totals, record counts, making sure that we know that we have a complete file. Because when we work with someone, whether it's in IT or finance, that's preparing the file for the, the data analysis, we do want to make sure that we have a complete file and that there haven't been any transactions that are omitted. So looking at the counts and control totals and even certain balances between our copy of the data and the official books and records, it's very important to make that comparison before the queries begin. Does that answer the, what you were seeking here with respect to, uh, to mapping data? It does. So why don't you turn this? I'm going I'm to have to suggest that I might leave that step to technical experts such as yourself. But uh, perhaps when it comes to uh, step three, uh, I might be able to re-engage with you a little bit more. So why don't you explain what step three is for us? Absolutely. Step three is really writing the queries. And as, as data analysis tools become friendlier and friendlier, the, uh, the business person that's asking and answering the questions can be the person that's writing the queries. Um, I've seen you do this before, Tom. We've got a, a column of numbers in Excel and you want to add them up, um, you can click on the, the sigma or you can type in the word sum and drag your mouse and you'll add up everything in the column. So when you do that, that's the, the simplest of all queries. 
but um, you know, more sophisticated query. That is to look at the the name of the vendor on the P card file and also the name of the vendor on the uh, the accounts payable invoice. Um, those are different. Those sometimes require more advanced um, programming and coding, but but certainly the techniques are the same. So um, our folks have uh, a number of, of specific. Um, kind of industry specific or audit specific analysis tools that we use. We also use general purpose um, business intelligence tools, including uh, visual software from Tableau. And we use those standard um, tools to write our queries. One of the things that's really important, though, is that we continue to engage the compliance practitioner like yourself to weed out um, false positives or, or transactions that appear to be a match, but upon further review, perhaps they're not. Um, one of the queries that we do looking for names of denied parties, we might compare the name of um, our vendor together with the names of uh, denied parties, and we want to we want to make sure that if we're ordering up a, a report from um, you know, boots on the ground in, in Asia because the surname is shared between our vendor and um, the name on the list, there are a number of two and three letter last names that are very common. Perhaps we should rely on more than the last name match. So it's really connecting that, that business question to the, the technical um, it becomes very important, and what we do um, is we, we want to involve the, uh, the compliance executives, uh, the compliance team, with the initial review of the query results, and we get guidance from them on whether we need to modify our queries based on those, uh, those initial results. So why don't you move us to uh, step four? Sure. So um, again, step four is, is where we go from writing the queries to really analyzing and reporting the results. And just as the, the first couple of steps are iterative, we go back and forth between brainstorming and acquiring the data, then we find out we're missing a column or two and we have to go back and get more data um, or modify our, our query um, and, and again, go, go get additional columns or rows. It is an iterative process between step three and step four, writing the queries and then reporting either what we would call preliminary results versus reporting final results. The preliminary results would say that we've got two invoices, same dollar amount, same vendor, very close in dates, and um, we want to make sure that um, we know whether it's a duplicate invoice or perhaps some other um, just anomaly in the data. So the research is to go look at the invoice or the invoice image, and if one of them says deposit and the other says final bill, that's not a duplicate. But if the, the two uh, invoice images both say final bill, and they're both for the same amount, but they're paid on two different check numbers, and obviously that is a, uh, a very likely duplicate payment. Um, so the analyze and reporting is to look, to take the output from the analytics and compare the, the preliminary results with inspection of, of other documents. So it's, so it's, it's really, taking the, the results and verifying them or validating them and then summarizing them in a way that an organization can take action. Um, our firm's tagline is See, Analyze, Act. And it's very important that if you're doing data analysis that you have a recommendation that is practical and actionable and that, that someone knows how to fix the, the problem. If an employee has submitted a $500 conference um, fee on an expense report and there's also an accounts payable check for the same $500, the, 
we, we don't know if we have a bad employee or if we have a bad vendor or if we have just an innocent mistake. So there's some additional information that you'd want to report um, to, to provide some context around some of the, uh, the transactions that your analysis might, might focus on. Um, we're very big fans. Obviously, our, our first name is, is Visual here at Visual Risk IQ. So I know we'll have a, a white paper with some examples for folks that want to, uh, to download that. And we'll have some example um, data analytics reports that summarize spending. We use things like color and size and even geography in some of our reports and dashboards so that the compliance practitioner can understand what has happened and quickly see and interpret um, whether the, the picture and the table and the graphs support your question that you've asked us which is, um, is the transaction in or out of compliance? So what's uh, step five? Step five is what we call refine and sustain. Our, our experience is that all of these, these data analytics activities, to be, to be really successful in the long term, to be really successful, they, they need to, to adapt and, um, and, and change with, the, uh, with the organization. So it could be as simple as, as updating some of the, uh, the red flag amounts or the red flag words based on um, experience with, uh, with the queries or um, just adapting to the, uh, the organization's business. Uh, I'll tell you a very good example of a refine and sustain query that we had for a, uh, a university. The university was very concerned. Um, it's, a, it's a violation of a federal compliance um, issue related to reimbursement of grant activities. So they wanted to identify all um, credit card transactions that were submitted for reimbursement on a federal grant that had alcohol. So they made a list of keywords, things like alcohol, and beer, and wine, and bar, and any um, expense reports that had those transactions um, with any of those keywords, they showed up in the stack to be reviewed by the compliance practitioner. Now, if you think about um, who operates the university bookstore at most, um, many college campuses today, um, one, of the, um, one of those key vendors is Barnes & Noble. So the letters B-A-R were causing every transaction at the bookstore to show up on the exception report. Now, it was a small technical challenge. We changed it from saying B-A-R, anything before or anything after those three letters, to space B-A-R space. And all of a sudden, the Barnes & Noble exception um, fell off of the suspicious transaction report. Refine and sustain is using your experience and looking at the research to modify the queries so that you have more genuine transactions that you want to, to review and fewer false positives that uh, cause you to, uh, to do some, some, uh, some evaluation or some research when upon further review you can modify the query so that uh, less um, less suspicious transactions are flagged if, in fact, it's not a, uh, a true compliance violation. Well, Joe, unfortunately, we're uh, at the end of our time for this podcast, but I wanted to, uh, to ask if someone wanted to um, follow up with you on any of the things that we talked about today or the blog post series we did, uh, how would they do it? Uh, certainly happy to take calls and, uh, and emails. Um, information should be available, full contact information on Twitter at Visual Risk IQ, LinkedIn, or, uh, or an email. How would I email you? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, first name dot last name, so J-O-E dot O-R-I-N-G-E-L at Visual Risk IQ dot com. Joe.oringel at visualriskiq.com. 
Well, Joe, uh, thank you, and I look forward to continuing the conversation where in our next episode we're going to talk about some of uh, you and visual risk IQ's case studies. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom. Good day. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. As you heard at the end of this podcast, this is part one. In part two, we're going to take a look at some of the case studies that Visual Risk IQ and Joe have engaged in, which I believe inform the transaction, uh, excuse me, transaction monitoring that would lend itself to a compliance practice. Also, please uh, listen to uh, part two as we have a special offer at the end of that podcast, which I'll announce. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening.